While it may seem strange to many in our celebrity-saturated world, there was a time when being famous was thought of as a curse for almost anyone who had accomplished something. Just a hundred years ago, before the true rise of what we now call mass media, only a few people in any society would be thought of as being famous. Making the headlines of a major newspaper wasn't a cause for celebration for most, but rather a nuisance that meant that one couldn't get on with the business of living one's life as one might be used to. As a general rule, only those associated with the arts carried with them the mantle of celebrity, and very frequently, they went to great lengths to hide or avoid it when they weren't performing. However, with the rise of what might be thought of as mass media, first with newspapers, and then with movies, radio, and eventually television, that began to change. While those in the arts continued to dominate the roles of those to whom notoriety clung, there began to be others, political figures, philosophers, and then popularizers of ideas. Unique among these after 1919 was Albert Einstein. While men like Arthur Eddington and James Jeans in Britain and Harlow Shapley and Percival Lowell in the United States would become well-known names on account of their willingness to become public communicators of scientific ideas, especially with regards to the cosmos. None so embraced the role of international celebrity as the German physicist whose ideas were understandable to only a small fraction of those who clamored to see him when he traveled. There had never been a phenomenon like Einstein's fame, and to a degree, I can't think of an instance of a scientist beyond perhaps Stephen Hawking, who has since captured the imagination of so many. Einstein was unique in that, unlike so many of his colleagues, he enjoyed the spotlight and he had the ability to give reporters simple and engaging quotes and of never taking himself too seriously in public. Early on, he was an eccentric but charming man who was willing to smile politely and, pal and patiently engage with those whose scientific training was lacking. Later, he transformed into everyone's genial grandfather who spoke out to encourage humanity to embrace its better nature. Moreover, in a time when sensationalism sold newspapers and movie tickets, there was nothing more sensational than a theory of physics that abolished the absolute. Easily written were the headlines and radio leaders that proclaimed that the universe as humanity knew it was overthrown. In the man-bites-dog world of the Roaring Twenties, the theory of relativity was tailor-made to fit the bursting of old-world structures and enlightenment and Victorian norms. Like so many of the intellectual currents of the rise of modernity, including those in art, literature, and philosophy, Relativity shattered old assumptions and questioned old ways of thinking about the world, something that became especially prevalent after the Great War shattered the myth of European progress. And so, with a message suited for the times, and a willing and capable messenger to preside over it, both the message and the messenger captured the public imagination in ways previously unseen. However, as is so often the case, this fame would come at a price for Einstein. Unsurprisingly, he didn't always understand the way in which his celebrity would affect him, those he knew, and even his culture. In time, it would drive him not just from Berlin, but from all of Europe, to a permanent exile in the one place that was ready to embrace his celebrity and not accuse him of fitting an untrue stereotype in order to vilify him and all of those like him. In this episode of The Scientific Odyssey, We'll chart Einstein's rise to fame and track how he tried to come to grips with the Pandora's box of issues his celebrity opened. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 50.8, Supplemental. Albert Einstein, The Price of Fame. 
Before we move forward in our narrative, it's useful to take a moment to move back to 1916 and consider the response to Einstein's general theory. As was the case in 1905, though for completely different reasons, the realization of the fundamental nature of the work was not immediately recognized by the broad physics community. Back in 1905, it was because Einstein was an unknown patent clerk, whose papers showed up more or less out of nowhere, and in at least two cases, offered Einstein insights that were completely unexpected. This time, however, the issue was twofold. The first was that the Great War had cut off almost all communication between members of the scientific community across nas national borders. This meant that while German physicists in Berlin who had attended the Prussian Academy of Sciences weekly meetings had heard the news, only those who had been at the Göttingen seminars knew what Einstein and Hilbert were up to outside of that small group. The second barrier was the same thing that had made it so hard for Einstein to get to this point. The math was really hard and kind of really out there. If you were an experimental physicist, your chances of knowing Riemann tensors were about zero unless you'd managed to attend school in Göttingen or later maybe Munich. If you tended to lean more classical in your training, meaning you worked in areas like fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, or even, at least for a time, astrophysics, the ideas of relativity here were very much likely on just right there on the outside edge of your interest. A contemporary analog might be something like this. Imagine someone working at CERN in particle physics, discovering a whole new way to understand the relationships between, say, quarks and leptons, which are things, by the way, that are like electrons, in such a way that suggested a whole new theory of matter but that used some really esoteric branch of mathematics, maybe something like spinner theory, to replace Feynman, Schwinger, and Tominaga's renormalization theory. If that were the case, there would probably be less than about 50 people in the entire world who would be able to understand that piece of work. Now, imagine also that that person's working in an environment where communication with researchers outside of CERN itself had been cut off, maybe for three or four years perhaps due to some sort of wild solar event that rendered electronic communication ineffective and made travel somewhat difficult. There are probably going to be a few people around who might pick up the ball and run with the idea to expand the theory and its applications, and there might be a few others who might devise ways to uniquely test the idea, but until a few people start being able to get on their bicycles or something like that, I don't know, colleagues at the Max Planck Institute or some other kind of center for physics research isn't going to be able to know about that idea. And that's not to mention those physicists at places like Cambridge's uh, Cavendish Labs or the research centers in the United States at facilities like Fermilab or the Stanford Linear Accelerator. In other words, the idea may be really groundbreaking and really important and really, really fundamental. But there are just going to be barriers to how that information gets communicated, you know, just on the basis of the fact that it's out there. And then, as in our example, maybe there's something else. And that was certainly the case when Einstein put forward the general theory of relativity in that series of lectures right at the end of 1915. So in the same way for Einstein's theories, what that means is there are only going to be a few people who are going to be able to take up his research and actually begin to work with it in some meaningful fashion. The first person to do this was somebody by the name of Carl Schwarzschild, who had been the director at Berlin's Potsdam Observatory when the war broke out. Now Schwarzschild, like so many others, had rushed off to join the war effort and had been stationed near the Eastern Front working on artillery trajectory calculations. As sort of a distraction from the horrors of wars, he managed to get the latest physics new research and news sent to him at the front, where he would kind of relax, if you can imagine this, by reading those papers in the journals that interested him. One such paper was Einstein's sort of formal write-up in 1916 of his talks that he had given to the Prussian Academy that presented general relativity and showed the solution for Mercury's orbital precession. As it turned out, Schwarzschild had the mathematical chops to understand Einstein's non-Euclidean field equations for gravitation, and he decided to see if he could apply them to the simple problem of calculating the curvature of space-time close to a simple, massive spherical object like the Sun. In late January of that year, 1916, he sent his calculations back to Einstein with full solutions to what the gravitational field would look like both outside and inside the Sun. He actually did this in two separate papers. 
Well, the calculations turned out to be kind of surprisingly simple when you really actually look at them, at least simple in the context of tensor theory. They showed kind of a really interesting result. What they showed was that if the central massive body was dense enough, that the amount of curvature would become effectively infinite, and this is the curvature of space-time, and that all sorts of odd things would start happening. For a body with the mass of the sun, if that mass were squeezed into a radius of, say, less than about two miles, it would turn out that even light would not be able to escape from inside that radius. Moreover, due to time dilation effects, as the object, or as in an, an object approached that radius from outside, an observer some distance from the central object would observe that for the infalling object, time would appear to slow down until, as the object reached what is now known as the event horizon, it would just sort of stop. It would, time wouldn't move forward and the thing would just look like it hung up on the event horizon. Now this kind of object, of course, is what we now know as a black hole. But at the time, and for many years after, no one, including Einstein himself, would believe such an object could actually exist in nature. Even after Chandrasekhar's work on white dwarfs indicated a similar result some two decades later. We now have strong observational evidence to go along with good theoretical modeling that tells us that such things do exist across the cosmos, but at the time, it was a really, really out there kind of uh, derivation that Schwarzschild had done. Einstein read Schwarzschild's two papers to the Prussian Academy in early 1916 and eagerly anticipated more. But in a tragedy that played out far too often in the years between 1914 and 1918, the war claimed Schwarzschild's life just a few months later. While he wasn't killed in combat, the astrophysicist contracted a skin disease due to the horribly unsanitary conditions and poor nutrition on the front and died shortly thereafter. It was more than just a little reminiscent of the de death of Minkowski shortly after that man began making contributions on the theory of special relativity. As for getting the word out about the general theory beyond Germany, the key figure here was Willem de Sitter. As we discussed de Sitter's role in spreading the theory in some detail in our earlier episode on relativity, I think it was episode 3.42, I won't say much other than to make a couple of additional points, three I think. The first is to recognize that it was de Sitter who really began using general relativity as a way to do cosmology something that would spur Einstein to take up research in that field as well. Both men would end up building early cosmological models in a context of what was thought to be a steady-state universe. In doing this, Einstein invoked an analogy that has become one of the touchstones of thinking about general relativity in terms of curved space-time. One of the difficulties of thinking about cosmological models is they can't actually be infinite in size. To try to work in that way leads to paradoxes where the universe either has to have an infinite amount of mass or there's an infinite amount of light or something along those lines. So what Einstein did was that he sh showed a way in which the universe, in all of its four-dimensional space-time glory, could close in on itself in such a way that it would be finite in extent but not actually have any bounds or boundaries. The best way to think of this is to work from an example that Einstein himself put forward. Imagine that there are these two-dimensional creatures flatlanders, if you will, that are able to exist only on the surface of something with no perception of higher dimensions, things like maybe height. Now, one way these flatlanders might imagine the universe is like a huge, flat sheet of two-dimensional space, an enormous sheet of paper, if you will. However, the problem, as we've said, is that the paper can't be infinitely large. That doesn't actually make any sense. However, if the sheet weren't actually flat, but rather the surface of an enormous globe, say the size of the Earth or even the Sun, then the flatlanders wouldn't actually perceive the curvature of the surface locally. But if they walked around the globe at its equator, well, they would find that they would eventually arrive back at where they started if they just walked long enough. This, Einstein argued, is how we must think of four-dimensional spacetime. This was a brilliant insight, but it had one problem, and that was that a universe of this sort wasn't really actually stable. It either had to expand or contract, with the preference being the latter, due to the self-gravitation of the mass that the universe was known to contain. Now, given that Hubble's publications were still a half a decade in the future, and Vesto Slipher was hesitant to draw the conclusion of an expanding universe from his data gathered at the Lowell Observatory, 
these models that were developed in these very first years after the publication of Einstein's field equation were either little more than intellectual exercises or they weren't taken as seriously as they should have been results-wise. A case in point was Einstein's model that suggested a non-steady state universe, what we just talked about. <clears throat> in other words, he didn't understand how you could have a universe that was expanding or contracting when obviously when you looked at it, the universe, at least what everyone thought they saw, was the steady state, non-changing universe. So to solve the problem that, he, that had occurred in his mathematics, Einstein added that cosmological constant to his field equation an addition that he would later call his greatest blunder once Hubble's results became wisely known, but should be noted nowadays is really, really important in our modern understanding of cosmological models. The second point to make here is that as a result of the interaction with the sitter, Einstein arrived at a result that under certain conditions, moving masses could produce gravitational waves in spacetime. Now, in the original 1916 paper, Einstein came up with three different types of waves, but soon after it was shown by others that two of these types of waves were actually artifacts that were created by the coordinate system that Einstein had chosen to do the math in. The third type of wave, however, known as transverse-transverse waves, were shown to be able to carry energy in a later paper, published in 1918, and it is these types of waves in space-time that were directly observed by LIGO in 2015. The final point here is to mention that through De Sitter, it was that Einstein's papers actually reached Arthur Eddington in Cambridge. Now, as we mentioned in our episodes on Eddington, the British astrophysical community was a pretty insular group of people. They didn't tend to regard the work of other groups as really being up to snuff, and this included that of the German astrophysicists. Between that sort of snobbery and being on opposite sides of the war, Einstein's work went unnoticed until Eddington was sent copies of the papers by De Sitter, and the entire theory caught his imagination. Over the next several years, Eddington would be instrumental in spreading Einstein's work in Britain and, to a lesser degree, in the United States. Additionally, Einstein would do work in gravitational wave theory that would sharpen the idea even as Einstein himself became convinced that the waves generated by physical processes known at the time would be so small as to be entirely undetectable. Of course, as we have mentioned, in the period between 1916 and the late 1930s, there was no indication of the existence of singularities such as black holes or of anything denser than white dwarf stellar remnants to be considered. It would not be until after World War II that astrophysicists and cosmologists would be consider begin considering more exotic physical phenomena in their models of stellar evolution and the universe, respectively. Of course, Eddington's greatest contribution to the Einstein narrative came in 1919 with his solar eclipse observations that demonstrated that the sun's curvature of space-time due to its mass was able to curve or bend light from a distant star as that light passed by the sun. We've discussed that in that episode that we already talked about in some detail, so let me summarize the results for members of the audience that might not either remember that or didn't have a chance to listen, and then move on to what it meant both on the scale of Einstein's personal life and on a larger international scale. As Einstein's ideas began to penetrate the isolationist shell of the British astrophysical community, it was thought, decided by both Eddington and the astronomer royal Frank Dyson that there should be a test of the prediction that starlight passing near the sun should be deflected by a specific amount that was about double what Newton's universal law of gravitation might predict. While the status of the mission was in some doubt as, after it was first proposed in early 1980, it did save Eddington from having to register as a conscientious objector and suffer the consequences of imprisonment during the war. Fortunately, with the end of the war in 1918, the mission was able to proceed without the threat to the ships being sunk en route by German submarines, and so it was that in June of 1918, or excuse me, 1919, Eddington was on the island of Prinkeep to make the needed measurements that would end up confirming Einstein's predictions, a huge step towards the acceptance of the general theory among many, though not all, scientists. 
So what was it like for Einstein in the weeks and months living, leading up to the announcement? Well, for starters, on a material basis, things were just not all that good. As we mentioned in the last episode, 1917 was the beginning of a long period of physical difficulty for Einstein. In that podcast, I mentioned that I could not find any information about what might have caused his ailment, but since then I've come across a source that suggested that his stomach problems were due to a particularly nasty ulcer, though that diagnosis seems to be part of a larger picture of wartime malnutrition and the effects of intense long-term stress. By 1918, the stomach ailment had cleared to a degree, in large part due to Elsa's care, and other things had calmed down a bit between Albert and Maleva. Nevertheless, the end of the war did not bring an end to the suffering and deprivation as Germany would continue to experience food and material shortages throughout the long winter and into 1919. Additionally, Einstein would once again take up the matter of divorce with Maleva, an issue that would cause them both a great deal of anguish, both emotional and physical. Nevertheless, as the year wore on, Einstein began to anticipate the results of the Eddington expedition, and when they were announced, he was catapulted to almost instantaneous international fame. So why did that happen? Why was it that the deflecting of starlight, something so inconsequential to the lives of almost any person who might have learned of the result, was such a big deal? There are, I think, several reasons, and all of them are kind of intertwined and related to each other. The first has to do with the idea of international cooperation, especially after the war. Europe had just come out of a four-year-long ordeal filled with atrocities and horrors that called into question all of the pre-war assumptions about progress and the virtues of developed society and the goodness of humankind and just you name it. And then this had been followed by another year of turmoil as governments fell and rose, currencies collapsed and then were propped up. Famine and revolution threatened at every turn, and people tried to come to grips with a conflict that had ground up an entire generation or two, maybe, of men for little actual result. It just all seemed like such a huge waste. It was that that the idea of two men from opposite sides of the conflict, in the name of science, perhaps seen as one of the very few things not sullied by the senseless violence with the whole thing of chemical warfare aside, of course, was a profoundly hopeful thing. The whole thing sort of signaled that maybe there was a way for the world to get beyond the horror and back to the ideals that everyone thought had reigned prior to what had happened in the war because of things like nationalism. It was really, you know, the result and the whole enterprise was a symbol that maybe, maybe, internationalism could overcome nationalism. And that, by the way, that symbolism was not something that was lost on either man, both of whom had very strong internationalist tendencies. The second reason I think the the theory took off had to do with its incredibly counterintuitive nature. The idea of absolute space and time is something pretty baked into the human psyche, I think, even though, at least in the case of time, philosophers have been questioning its very existence, much less its nature, since before Aristotle. When the complexity of the general theory was added to its fundamental strangeness in terms of how it described reality, there arose this sort of juxtaposition of astonishment and bewilderment among nearly everyone who encountered it. As one of the great stories about this whole thing goes, when the Royal Astronomical Society and the Royal Society held an official joint meeting to announce the results of Eddington's mission on November 6th of 1919, There was among those who gathered only a few who fully understood both the theory and the experimental results to engage with them fully. After the presentation, something done by Dyson, one of the attendees tracked Eddington down and said that he had heard that only three people in all the world understood it, one of whom, of course, was Einstein. When Eddington, as was often his custom, was slow to respond, The man chided him for his false humidity in sort of declining to include himself among those who got it, so to speak. Einstein responded, quote, On the contrary, I was just wondering who the third person might be, end quote. So it gives you a sort of sense of that, you know, wow, what an amazing, astonishing theory, and oh my gosh, I have no idea what any of this is about. As news of the discovery, of course, spread from the meeting, papers all over the world trumpeted the result, something neither the reporters nor their editors really understood. 
Nowhere is this more evident than with the New York Times, which back in those days was a bit more populist in its editorial policy. The paper didn't have a science correspondent in Europe, and so it sent its English golf reporter, um, and no, I'm not making this up, that's really who they sent, to attend the meeting and to send them back some information for some stories. At first, the man didn't actually think the meetings was, was worth attending, but after a bit of asking around, he realized that such a joint affair was really quite unusual. He then tried to attend, only to find that there wasn't enough room in the presentation hall, something that forced him to sit outside and try to catch what scraps he could. Therefore, what he did is he sort of followed up by placing a phone call to Eddington, who had to explain what had occurred in the meeting and sort of what was going on and what was talking about multiple times, each time simpler than the last before the poor reporter could get a handle on what it was that he was supposed to report on. While the European papers were fairly restrained in their coverage, at least at first, the New York Times, after a similarly low-key first headline, took to sensationalizing things by playing on the theory's incomprehensibleness contrasted with the way it fundamentally changed humanity's understanding of the cosmos. The most famous headline was one of these six-decker sort of things that posted, you know, everything above the fold, and it began with the, quote, lights all askew in the heavens. And it was followed by, you know, a couple of lines down, a book for 12 wise men, sort of suggesting that there were only 12 men in the whole world who could even understand what was uh, going on in the theory. For over a week, these sorts of headlines breathlessly graced the front page of the New York Times, each, you know, more outrageous than the last, indicating that astronomers were perplexed or at a loss to explain or were in a state of crisis or whatever before the paper decided to pull back a little to say in a somewhat chastising tone that the sun was still rising in the east and setting in the west as if it were the scientific community rather than the media who was creating and stoking a public frenzy over the results. And by the way, if, you, if this just seems all a little bit strange that the headlines of this sort would boost newspaper sales significantly, allow me to pass along, you know, just kind of a personal observation. One of the things I do is I run a small science cafe in, here in the, the small town in which I live. And as a part of that, I get to talk to others who coordinate similar events all over the area around me. Furthermore, I actually have, along with a former student of mine, Vedant Mehta, we have a talk that we give on the direct detection of gravitational waves. One of the things we know is that nothing packs a science cafe like a presentation on the cosmos. We know all sorts of cool things about, you know, you know how to make, you have indigenous wildlife in your backyard or indoor and outdoor clean air or clean water and all sorts of things. And those are all attended reasonably well. But, you know, we put something on our, our monthly meeting or a monthly gathering where we're going to talk about space or the cosmos or relativity or something like that, and I tell you, the house is always packed. Moreover, I can tell you, too, that when Vedant and I go out and we give our talk on gravitational waves, we always fill the house at whatever science cafe we're talking about. It's always really well attended when we give the talk, and we always get great reviews, even when the participants admit that they don't really understand what it is we're talking about a whole lot. To them, it's just really cool that human beings can do this stuff, and that one human being in particular, Albert Einstein, was able to figure all of this out with nothing but pen and paper and an incredibly creative imagination. Similarly, in the few years following the 1919 announcement, physicists all over Europe and England were besieged to give talks and presentations that were overwhelmingly well received. And in the years between the announcement and about 1925, over 600 books, and that's, that's an amazing number if you think about it back in, you know, the early 1900s, over 600 books were published on relativity alone, with authors, authors being such luminaries as Max Born, Heinrich Lorenz, and the amazingly young and precocious Wolfgang Pauli. This brings us to the third reason uh, this stuff was also very um, popular, and that is Einstein himself. It takes a certain type of person to be able to capture the presses and through the media, the public's imagination. And Einstein, it turned out, was, well, that kind of person. He was kind and genteel, serious without taking himself seriously, patient with those who were trying to figure out how to talk about his work, and seemingly always ready with a bit of wit or a good story or an apt metaphor when that was what was needed. There was a certain roguish charm that allowed him to make a bit of fun of himself and his work without diminishing it, and he was a bit of a ham. 
It was, in essence, a combination of his childlike nature, his emotional detachment to a degree, and his rebelliousness that allowed him to embrace what it was the press needed him to be at any given moment. He could be, in a sense, all men to all media people. A serious scientist when speaking at Cambridge or Harvard, a bit of a trickster in front of a camera, a teller of tales and stories when talking with a reporter. He was not the typical boring and stuffy academic who droned on about whatever it was he was working on, but rather a charming man who understood the value of a good soundbite and who seemed to be sort of letting you in on the joke in a way. And unlike most of the folks at that time in his position, he didn't actually mind the celebrity. In time, though, he would find that the very celebrity that he was sort of embracing could become a two-edged sword. The first big interview that he gave was on December 2nd of 1919 to a reporter in Berlin. This is where the apocryphal story of the equivalence principle being inspired by a falling man seems to have first appeared as a bit of fabrication by the newspaper writer who needed to find a way to relate Einstein's thought experiment to the general reader. Einstein, when questioned about the narrative, lamented the exaggeration, but also indicated that such was the way of popular writing, and he more or less let it pass. His sister, upon reading the story, expressed her dismay at what she perceived as an invasion of his privacy, not understanding that Einstein was actually enjoying the attention, even as he claimed to find it burdensome. To Max Born, he would write at about this same time that he was, quote, hounded by the press and other riffraff. It's so dreadful that I can barely breathe anymore, not to mention getting around to any sensible work, end quote. In a letter to another friend, he used a wonderfully illustrative metaphor, quote, since the flood of newspaper articles, I've been so deluged with questions, invitations, and requests that I dream I'm burning in hell, and the postman is the devil, eternally roaring at me, hurling new bundles of letter at my head because I've not yet answered the old ones, End quote. And yet, even as he complained, he really loved all the attention. As the paparazzi of today will tell you, no one becomes a celebrity without their own permission. If you don't want to do an interview, you don't respond to the request. If you don't want your picture taken, you don't tell the photographer where you'll be. As the Einstein biographer and essayist C.P. Snow writes, quote, There was a streak in him that enjoyed the photographers in the crowds. He had an element of the exhibitionist and the ham. If there had not been that element, there would have been no photogra- photographers and no crowds. Nothing is easier to avoid than publicity. If one genuinely doesn't want it, one doesn't get it. End quote. In 1920, however, things seemed to go a bit too far for the scientific community that surrounded Einstein when they learned that a Jewish journalist by the name of Alexander Moskowski was working on a biographical look at the scientist's life that was being dubbed as a sort of uh, conversations with Einstein kind of thing. While this type of literature is pretty unremarkable today, it was considered a bit scandalous that a serious figure would have such a memoir written prior to his death in the European culture at the time. Einstein's friends pressured him to have the publication of the work stopped, something he half-heartedly attempted and was unsuccessful at. While the consternation of the whole thing, and if you want to read more about this, you can in any number of the biographies, but while everything kind of turned out to be much ado about not very much, it is illustrative to understand the argument against the book as it will shed some light on later events. One of the things that academics were expected to do in their pursuit of knowledge and truth at least in some idealized picture of things, was to avoid the perception of both self-promotion and commercialization. These were the things that were kind of done by the business class of a society. And to do that was sort of, it was seen as sort of bringing a kind of a, to use the term that was very often put forward at the time, a shopkeeper's mentality to what was supposed to be a pure seeking of knowledge. Now, if you heard a bit of a dog whistle in that phrase, shopkeeper's mentality, you would be absolutely correct. In much of Europe at the time, it was those members of the Jewish community that were frozen out of many of the other professions that often went into commercial business kinds of things, such as being bankers or lawyers, and of course, just being shopkeepers. As such enterprises were often seen as crass or vulgar by the upper classes and intelligentsia of old European nobility, To say that somebody had a shopkeeper's mentality was really a bit of an insult deeply rooted in anti-Semitism. As you may recall, it was a concern of the faculty at one of the early institutions Einstein had applied for a job at. 
The common nature of the chatty biography, filled as it was with folksy and amusing stories from Einstein's first 40 years, was a bit of, a, of an affront to those who preferred a picture of Einstein that was the, that of the proper and distinguished Herr Professor. The fact that the biography was written by a Jew, about a Jew, for quick profit, played into the idea that Einstein, like the anti-Semitic stereotype so often portrayed, was trying to turn a quick buck off his fame. Fortunately, at least in the short term, the popularity of Einstein's work and his own personality overshadowed all of this, and the biography was generally pretty well received. However, in just a couple of years, it and other similar actions would be raised by German nationalists and fascists as a tool to attack Einstein and his Jewishness. As a part of the international furor over the theory of relativity, the Times of London asked Einstein to write a piece for the newspaper explaining the scientific ideas of the theory as well as the experimental evidence supporting it. The result, appropriately titled, What is the Theory of Relativity?, was a surprisingly accessible discussion that included a wry example by its author of what relativity might be, one that would soon resonate with bitter irony. Einstein wrote, quote, by an application of the theory of relativity. Today in Germany, I am called a German man of science, and in England, I am represented as a Swiss Jew. If I come to be recorded as sort of a bête noir, the descriptions will be reversed, and I shall become a Swiss Jew for the Germans and a German man of science for the English." End quote. The first part of this was really illustrated later that year, when Einstein was nominated to be awarded a gold medal by the Royal Astronomical Society. However, the honor, to be given to one who was a citizen of a country Britain was so recently at war with, and who was a Jew rather than a Christian, stirred within the society a small but vocal group who argued that the prize was an affront, and it was their voice that carried the day. And so here we see Einstein seen not as a man of science, but instead as just a Swiss Jew. The second part of the quote, however, would be longer in coming. But even as early as 1920, there were those in Germany who had, become advocate, had begun advocating for an overthrow of the Weimar government, and it tapped into the bitter vein of German nationalism and resentment to rally the disaffected to their cause. At that time, the German economy was in tattered, and people were actually suffering. And not just a little bit, they were really suffering. And so, these groups, their words of anger, found many willing ears, and as a part of their message, they had the idea that the Jew was a part of the coalition that had betrayed the nation, something that would be built on, as many of you already know, over the next decade. For Einstein and many other Jews, there were a number of ways to deal with the long-simmering anti-Semitism that had been a part of Central European culture for centuries. Now, since the unification of 1871, German culture had always really dealt with a significant undercurrent of this sort of thing. And so, if you were a Jew in Berlin, for example, you had to sort of come up with a way of dealing with this. One option was assimilation. This path had been taken by many who never really much identified with the religious aspects of their heritage and who saw the taking of German culture tradition and some sense religion as a way to show the society that they were loyal. Scientists like Franz Haber took this route, even going so far as to change his name and to become a Christian and to do work for the German Empire during the Great War. On the other side, though, there were those who argued against such acts of assimilation, saying that they wouldn't actually solve the problem of being seen as the quote-unquote other by those of Teutonic heritage but instead would feed the rantings of those who said that Judaism and Jewish culture was weak and should be eliminated altogether. These voices said that Jews should embrace their heritage, display it proudly, and show that it was not a threat to Germany or anyone else. In the years after the Great War, each of these views would be put to the test. For Einstein, there was an interesting result of all of this. Up to that point, he had held his heritage at something of an arm's distance. He didn't really completely identify as a Jew. He certainly didn't practice the religion. Um, he was very much a non-practicing Jew who felt that much of the overtly religious part of Jewish culture was unnecessary. 
While his own views on matters of faith were evolving throughout his life, and especially during this time, it seems that before the war, he didn't really closely identify with being Jewish as much of a cultural heritage. It's not that he assimilated, it's just not something that really entered his mind. However, as anti-Semitism began to become a theme of attack among Jewish nationalist views after the war, Einstein became sort of a target due to both his fame and misinterpretations of the philosophical implications of his work. And what happened for him was that the detached Jew began to find himself drifting into the camp of those who found identity within their Jewish heritage. What made this even more interesting was that, like some who found themselves doing so, Einstein became something of a Zionist. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Zionism during the period leading up to this time and afterwards, the idea was that, due to a long history of persecution, the Jewish people needed to be able to find a place wherein they could conduct their own affairs and practice their own faith and peace without interference from Christians or Muslims. While a number of different options for this would be put forward as a way to realize the idea, the one that always held the, held the greatest resonance, of course, was the restoration of a Jewish homeland in the region of the Eastern Mediterranean known alternatively as the Levant or Palestine, but that had once been the ancient kingdom of Israel or Judea. Einstein was approached to be a part of this movement by its leader, Kurt Blumenthal, in 1919, but was non-committal at first. However, as the attacks by the nationalists on him began to grow, they pushed him in a direction that was very much kind of in that way. Einstein became enamored especially by the idea of establishing in Palestine, specifically in Jerusalem, an institution of higher education specifically devoted to educating those of Jewish heritage, an institution that would ultimately become Hebrew University. Over the next two years, there would be three events that would push Einstein further into the Zionist camp as well as make him a target of German nationalists. The first was a dispute of a somewhat scientific nature that arose in 1920. While I won't go into all of the details here as they're a bit convoluted, the upshot was that among those pushing German nationalism were a few common individuals looking to use the movement to make a buck off the gullible and vulnerable. One such person was a man by the name of Paul Valand. He was an engineer turned politician who sought to use the anger and demagoguery as a way to gain some power and run a bit of a scam. Basically, get a bunch of people to come to rallies that he held, you know, pay a bunch of money that he would then sort of just pocket and spend and, you know, that kind of thing. Now, with him was a physicist of some reputation by the name of Ernst Gerke who is best characterized as one of those physicists who was finding the transition from classical to modern physics difficult and disturbing. Gerke believed that relativity was deeply flawed, that it was a bad theory, and he was willing to go out in public and say so, something that Valen saw as a way to rally people to his banner, kind of show that this Jew's ideas were just bad ones. The reason this was effective was that shortly after the first accounts of relativity were published, there were those, some informed, many less so, who equated the you know, relativity and the theory of relativity with the rising philosophical movement known as relativism, usually on the basis of Einstein's rejection of absolute reference frames. Now to be clear, Einstein was never a relativist in any way, shape, or form. He was about as far from that as you could possibly be. But in a post-war world where everything was being questioned, relativity's newness and overthrowing of long-held beliefs about the nature of space and time fed into the cultural insecurities both in Germany and other places that old structures of society were crumbling and about to be overthrown. Weiland used this sphere, along with Gerke's attacks, to assail Einstein as a symbol of what was wrong with Germany and its Jewish population, bringing up the shopkeeper accusation among other things. Einstein, once he learned of this, decided to engage his detractors and attend one of the rallies. In doing so, two things happened. First was that he was incensed by the nature of the personal attacks, and the second was that he got his hands on some of the movement's literature. In it, Gerke had invoked the figure of the German physicist Philippe Lenard, who had first observed the photoelectric effect and had won the Nobel Prize for doing so. Lenard had been critical in comments about relativity, and Gerke had used those comments without Lenard's knowledge or permission to assail Einstein. As a result, Einstein responded with a somewhat unhinged polemic of his own in a well-known Jewish liberal newspaper that was published in Berlin. 
It was not a well-considered piece that was written out of anger, and in it Einstein attacked not only Velen and Gerke, but also Lenard. The whole thing was not well received either by the German public or by Einstein's Jewish colleagues in the scientific establishment. Lenard, for his part, was incensed by the attacks as he felt, somewhat justifiably, that they were unwarranted and that they should have been addressed in a scientific forum, something that actually would take place later that year. It would also create a huge schism between Einstein and Lenard, something that would play out later. The second wedge would be Einstein's trip to America to raise money for Zionist causes. The trip would combine scientific presentations at a number of universities in the Northeast and Midwest with fundraising rallies. On these visits, Einstein was wildly popular, and while the trip didn't raise as much money as Blumenthal and the other Zionists in the United States would have hoped, it was still a useful enterprise. It would be on this trip that Einstein would utter one of his most famous quotes. While at Princeton, he was presented news that an American experimental physicist had results that indicating that he had actually measured the speed that the Earth traveled through the ether and that the speed of light was in fact variable, a direct contradiction of relativity theory. When Einstein heard of the news, he turned to a colleague expressing his doubt in the accuracy of the work, saying, quote, Subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. End quote. The mathematician Oswald Veblen overheard this remark, and when the building that would eventually house the Institute of Advanced Study was built in Princeton, he asked Einstein permission to carve the words in the fireplace mantle, a request that Einstein granted, adding that what he meant by the quote was, quote, nature hides her secret because her is her essential loftiness, not by a means of ruse, end quote. As a humorous coda to this anecdote, after Einstein had emigrated to the United States and had settled at Princeton, he attended the retirement party for a close friend that was held in the room. And he noted to his friend, the mathematician Hermann Weil, that the quote might have another meaning, or at least might need to be reconsidered. While nodding at the quote, he's said to have sort of quipped to uh, Weil, who knows, perhaps he is a little malicious. Now, the thing that galled Einstein's German colleagues about this whole trip wasn't as much as the tr wasn't as much the trip to America as it was what he missed to make that trip. Originally, Einstein had planned to attend the 1921 Solvay conference, the first to be held at, after the end of the Great War. Now, on account of the manifesto of the 93, something we discussed in our last episode, German scientists were actually barred from being invited to conferences organized by countries that had been allied with Entente powers or who had been neutral as one of the provisions in the Treaty of Versailles. Einstein, as one who had not signed the document and whose name was associated with the counter-manifesto that had been circulated shortly after, was treated by the scientific community as sort of an exception to this rule, something that was workable due to his dual citizenship with this, you know, his original citizenship actually being Swiss. Hence, when he was invited to attend the Solvay conference, it was seen in Germany as something of a victory, a re-acceptance as it were into the scientific community, even if only just a little bit. Einstein, however, saw things in a very different way. For him, attending the conference would be something that would kind of provide cover for what he saw as an unnecessary and short-sighted punishment that held Germans healing from the war back. Attending, in his mind, would be to paper over the injustice, and so when the invitation to tour America came along, it gave him a legitimate reason to skip the conference, something he did. Unfortunately, many of the German scientific community disagreed with his choice. The third wedge that came along was that not long after the American trip, Einstein attended a big event in England that brought together the cream of British society, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, to celebrate the cooperation between Einstein and Eddington and allow Einstein to speak to concerns regarding relativity and relativism with the Archbishop. Here again, while a bit overwhelming, the event was a success from a scientific point of view, but it was seen as something very disloyal to those nationalists in Germany. For them, what they saw was that the Swiss Jew had now gone to two of Germany's wartime enemies, powers that had forced a humiliating peace on their proud country, and it sort of regaled them with his brilliance. And so this would end up serving to fulfill that second part of Einstein's faithful quote to the Times of London. In England, in two years, he had transitioned from being a Swiss Jew to being a German man of science. 
while in Germany, he was now a disloyal Jew that was part of that group of collaborators who had conspired to stab the Fatherland in the back. In 1922, this was brought directly to Einstein's doorstep when his friend and fellow traveler, Walther Rathnau, a fellow Jew who had risen to become the Weimar government's foreign minister, was assassinated by a group of young German nationalists. While much of Germany was horrified by the act of violence, many nationalist leaders hailed the act as one of heroism, including one little-known Bavarian politician by the name of Adolf Hitler. Word soon came that Einstein's name was at the top of some lists of other Jews to eliminate, being circulated among the underground fascist groups that were out there. Fame was now showing its darker side, something Einstein had never considered in 1919 when he sat down to be interviewed for the first time. As we conclude this episode, just a quick update on the show. I've survived another finals week, as have my students, and for the first time in 17 years, I'm taking a summer off from academia. I plan to do a lot of work on the show over the next few months, and so, hopefully, I'll now be back on a more regular schedule. Additionally, I have plans to go back and re-record some of those first few dozen episodes with the hope of improving the sound quality and delivery of those shows. If you skip those due to their technical inferiority, and trust me, they're pretty technically inferior, give me a bit of time and then go back and see if there's some improvement. I think that the history of the atom is a fascinating thing and I don't want anyone to miss out on it because I had a bad microphone or was still trying to find my voice. No shout out this week as I've been up to my eyeballs and gritting, but if there's something you'd like me to bring to the crew's attention, feel free to drop me a line at cldavies at mac.com or post something to the Scientific Odyssey's Facebook group, and we'll see what we can do. Also, we're always looking for more crew, so if you know someone who might enjoy the journey, please let them know. One way to do that is to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Chad Davies, and uh, just check out what I'm posting there. I try to treat, tweet out, I should say, a link to each episode as it's released, and if you'd retweet that for your followers to see, I'd sure appreciate it. Also, if you just want to tweet out a link to the show in general, to our website, to our TypePad page, whatever the case may be, we'd love it if you did that. So next time, we'll follow Einstein through the tumultuous years of the 1920s and early 30s as he was awarded a Nobel Prize and then tried to come to grips with not only the rising tide of fascism and anti-Semitism in Europe, but also with a reinterpretation of quantum mechanics led by a new generation of novin physics that was fostered by an old friend and a friendly rival from Copenhagen. Until then, full sails on your journey.